Well, I'm glad I didn't get drinks. Uh, I do a lot of keynote presentations, very few during lunch. Uh, but this is actually kind of cool. You guys are going to be high on sugar. If you haven't gone back, uh, hit the dessert tray yet. It's pretty wonderful. Anyway, we're going to talk today about state of cloud migration, what's occurring now, and what will occur in 2015 and 2016. And the reality is I got some opinions. I got some ways to segment the market. And I got some fresh data. Actually, it's uh, cool working with GigaOM uh, because I have access to some great research and uh, has some stuff that's uh, fresh off the press, so to speak, uh, that I can share with you in terms of where the market's going. I think there's a few things that you'll understand are going to be cool, and there's a few things that are going to be surprises. You guys can start the clock. So cloud application migration, this is typically what people are feeling like right now, the ability to move an application from an on-premise system, uh, perhaps even in a colo provider and a managed service provider, and then moving it directly into a cloud provider, and then having it run efficiently there, hopefully less costly, hopefully uh, more uh, agile, hopefully more effective, and hopefully it can meet the needs of the users. And that seems to be a tough road to hoe, to be honest with you. We're getting all kinds of different kind of results that are coming back as people are moving from on-premise systems into the cloud. And the reason is I think people really have a tendency not to understand exactly what that means. And people are making core mistakes and not doing architecture. Some of the things I'll reveal during the presentation. So these are kind of the application migration common methods and approaches that are out there today. They range from retire. In other words, just throw the application away and start new. Uh, in the cloud all the way to replace and rebuild, refactoring, reuse, replatforming, rehosting, and retaining. And what's occurring now is that people have a tendency to underestimate or underutilize uh, uh, the target cloud-based platforms for what they're, use, what, what they're going to be used for. So we have suddenly, are we going to move to the cloud? Are we going to move to the cloud? Are we going to move to the cloud? And then everybody deciding, and I can guarantee, I know the date, it was March 24th of 2013, that they wanted to move into the cloud and move all their applications as quickly as possible. And so, you know, as a cloud consulting firm, we got, you know, loads and loads of calls. We want to move 200 applications, 600 applications, and do so ASAP. We and I've always typically, we already sold this to the board as the greatest thing since sliced bread. We figure that's going to be $11 per application to make this thing happen. And we need about 10 migrated a week. And haven't really considered the strategic direction is where that stuff is looking to go because of not looking at where these things are occurring. The fact of the matter is that I'm finding a few things that are relatively surprising. Uh, some disappointing, I think some pleasantly surprising. The first thing, and I heard this in a couple of presentations today, cloud computing is not always going to be more cost effective. Cloud-based resources aren't going to be always more cost effective than the existing on-premise way of doing something. So you have to do the costing out and the moving and figuring out what this stuff is going to cost you moving forward. I just got off the phone with a client today that's looking to move either to AWS, to uh, Rackspace, or to SoftLayer. And they wanted to figure the cost of doing so. One of the things we put, started to put in the cost of the additional security, the cost of the maintenance, cost of operations, cost of doing the porting, cost of the, you know, having certain assets that you're managing in the cloud. Um, many aspects of it were very cost effective and something they should do for certain applications, and many aspects were non cost effective currently, and they need to wait to go ahead and make those things occur at some point in the future. So these sorts of data points are popping back at us right now. The big thing to understand from this particular slide is that you're going to have to typically modify the application significantly to take advantage of the native cloud platform. So the idea that we can lift and shift our way to success with this and just go ahead and take an application, push it into the cloud, recompile it, get it running, and then call it a success typically isn't what we're finding as being successful. That doesn't mean there has to be a huge gutting of the application, but there has to be enough modification or refactoring of the application that occurs in order for you to gain value in the cloud platform you're, living, you're looking to move into. And that's going to be kind of key throughout the theme of the presentation. And I, I guess my role in the cloud industry is always as the designated buzzkill. Um, but you got to be careful as you start moving to any new technology. And cloud computing is really no different. 
So comparison of the micro, uh, migration strategies, we have the rehost or the lift and shift. So the pros that we found are rapid migration, lower initial costs, current skill sets can do it, lower functional, uh, functionality risk. And the cons are you know, potential impacts from cloud component failures, unpredictable performance, no dynamic scaling typically, and monitoring gaps typically are there, and higher long-term TCO that's going to occur. So in other words, I'm able to do this for, uh, say, $100,000 in applications, relatively cheap, all in architecture, things like that. However, the uh, money that I'm going to spend in maintaining the system, either in the cloud fees, you know, the, the, the money that Amazon or other cloud providers are charging me, or the increase in total cost of ownership could significantly outweigh any benefits of moving in that direction. So you sit down and eat, I mean, the core thing is you've got to figure out how to do uh, what the cost is and what the value is is going to be ahead of time. The other was refactoring, which is rewriting or changing the app somewhat to take advantage of some or most of the cloud native features. And so we're able to do dynamic scalability, elasticity. We're able to you know, do failover capabilities, all these other things that may not be um, accessible if we're not leveraging the cloud native features. So the pros of that would be leverage cloud strengths and scalability, automation, higher resiliency, greater trans transparency and metrics, lower total cost of ownership. Cons are slower migration, higher initial cost, new tools and skill sets, and extensive testing. So migrating the cloud does not come without an expense. It does not come without risk. It does not come without some deep analysis. It does not come without architecture and planning. And it does not come out with a lot, I think, I think the things, you know, if you go back to 2006, they were being kind of bantered about as a reason for moving into cloud. That doesn't mean you shouldn't make the movement. However, um, you should do the analysis first as to what value you're going to get from making the movement. And so we're seeing some trends that are really kind of proving this out. So triage, planning, roadmaps, uh, budgetary constraints, uh, skill set requirements, and that's a huge one. Even the political, uh, uh, the, the political uh, internal strife that you deal with in the organization moving in that direction should all be considered. I've seen a lot of cloud migrations killed just because we can't get people in the organization convinced that that's the right thing to do. I've seen a lot of cloud migrations killed because the skill sets aren't there. So make sure you consider that as you move forward. Co so the keys to success, application migration at scale, successful migration of the cloud for large application portfolios require thinking and planning strategically, rapidly iterating through the feedback loops, automating, measuring, continuously improving, and scaling at an accelerated pace. In other words, learning as you go, making sure we kind of dial back in the issues that we've had uh, in the past um, into the development process, leveraging DevOps operations where it makes sense, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, uh, you know, iteration where it makes sense, and in essence, getting better at migrating applications as you start migrating applications into the cloud. Also allows you to get better at building new applications by changing skill sets and adapting to kind of the new capabilities of this environment. Tools and platforms are still immature, so approaches must align with rapid pace of innovation, strong governance organizational impact, skills and retooling um, you know, should not be underestimated. So do we have the wherewithal within the organization in terms of skill, political will, budget, uh, disruptiveness, tolerance for risk to go ahead and make these changes? If the answer is yes, chances are you're going to be successful in moving in this direction. You're typically going to have a positive outcome. You're going to save costs. You're going to increase agility. You can do all the things that cloud is able to do. If you don't have those capabilities, then you need to consider uh, eyes wide open in terms of what moving to the cloud actually means to you and what you're able to accomplish and what you won't be able to accomplish and maybe take a slower stepwise approach, more iterative approach in moving into the cloud uh, than I think currently, uh, currently we see. So everybody went from never us, we're never gonna do it, to let's do it as quickly as possible, to oops, we made a bunch of mistakes, let's do it a little bit more methodical and reliable way. So the program models for application migration is crawl, walk, run, fly. 
uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then on forward. Crawl, application portfolio assessment, pilot migrations, initial cloud endpoints, technology selection. In other words, get into this stuff in a slow way. You don't jump into it feet first. Uh, especially if you're a large organization, it's almost death. When uh, disruptiveness occurs to the point people can't deal with it anymore and people ignore it and suddenly get just pushed out. Walk, patterns and tool metrics, refinement, um, basically, you know, do the second tranche of migrations, process tuning, DevOps, all these sorts of things really need to be in there and get those things going. Most organizations that I deal with that I consider advanced and innovative are really at the walk stage these days. Run, basically discovery, migration, initial app migration, fact, re, uh, factoring, initial refactoring patterns, DevOps provisioning, all these sorts of things, which gets into more advanced concepts. In other words, we're able to move faster we're leveraging this stuff in the context of a true DevOps infrastructure, a DevOps organization. We know how to do continuous delivery, continuous development, continuous deployment, all these sorts of things. We have the tools in place to make this stuff happen. We have the people in place to make this stuff happen. It's an organization I typically see less than 1% of the time. Never see the fly, but we should be getting to the fly in terms of the ability uh, to um, uh, leverage AMS and multiple BUs, migration and scale, operational automation, continuous delivery, continuous improvement, and a full-blown DevOps organization where everything is automated from the design of the system to the deployment of the system, and there's very little latency that it's occurring uh, between those steps. So how come we're not there yet? Well, we'll start looking at some of the patterns of adoption that are occurring out there in the space. So lack of architecture leads to poor performing and expensive cloud deployments. Um, I can't get this enough. And the thing is, it's uh, you know, as an old guy, when I talk about architecture, I think people conjure up you know these images of these people in the organization running around telling them no, and putting you know six months analysis and design into a single application. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is there has to be some iterative planning that occurs and some thinking that occurs in how you're gonna move in this direction. Organizations, they think, are getting that these days, by the way. A couple of years ago, I just had a problem with people not doing that. They wanted to kind of jump feet first you know, into the technology. In fact, most of the people who called me up uh, would say, we want you to help us on our Amazon project or our Rackspace project or our, uh, our software project um, because they led with technology, not design. They led with what was cool and sexy not necessarily what was the harder part of moving in these directions. And therefore, we have performance issues, we have expensive cloud deployments, we have a lot of failures that are occurring out there through simple lack of planning that wouldn't have taken that long, maybe a week or two. So some key advice, you know, properly take advantage of the cloud platform, including your infrastructure as a service and platform as a service cloud you picked and design the application so they are decoupled from any specific physical resource. So if you're gonna build this stuff, you build it the right way first. Make sure it's decoupled and abstracted away from the physical clouds or away from the cloud uh, platform you're moving into. You're not designing this with, um, with uh, a coupling in mind, the path of least resistance, you're thinking service oriented, you're thinking decoupling the data from the existing systems, you're thinking abstraction layers, you're thinking configuration and the ability to kind of change things through some sort of automation layer uh, versus changing things programmatically in the cloud. Clouds can provide an abstraction or virtualization layer between the application and the underlying physical or virtual resource, whether you're designed for cloud or not. So you have to think in terms of how this rule is gonna to apply to you building the applications. Now, in many instances, we have a tendency to look at application developers as cloud developers, and that's not necessarily gonna be the case. People who are very good at developing applications on clouds are hard to find. There's not too many of them out there and designing the applications, deploying the applications, coding techniques, things like that. Uh, however, and also the ability to kind of follow these rules of design in making sure that when your application is deployed, that the limitations of the application in terms of performance, over coupling, all those sorts of things aren't necessarily systemic in the applications you're looking to build. 
So when this architecture is considered in the design, development, and deployment of an application to utilize the underlying cloud resources, can be as much as 70% more efficient, and that's proven. So you do a little work, you get a lot of benefit. Do a lot of work, you get a lot of benefit. Your planning and your design and you're looking at utilization of these systems correctly and moving into these directions is absolutely going to be dependent on your ability to be successful if you're defer determining success by the cost efficiencies and by the use of by the ability to provide more agile systems, the ability to scale up, ability to become a better company in terms of, in terms of IT. So if the cost metrics aren't there, by the way, um, you can declare success any way, shape, or form, but if you're looking to become cheaper, better, faster, and more effective and efficient, that's a different game. And I think we're learning that these days, uh, that it just takes a little bit more skill, a little bit more talent than we originally thought we needed. So getting into some of the research results as to what we're finding out there in this space, and this is from a uh, survey GigaOM just did, I think a month or so ago, and I wrote it up on gigaOM.com, and I think it's, uh, since it's a sponsored report, I think you can download it just by registering, uh, but it was sponsored by Datapipe. And the items discovered in the survey, just to summarize it up, is number one, public clouds quickly expanding, application deployment and testing are among the highest values of using cloud, so app dev test is becoming the killer kind of application for cloud-based systems as well as data. Larger numbers of business units leverage public cloud resources, um, typically in let AWS is leading, leading the way. Surprising number of public cloud instances support da uh, daily operations for many businesses. First cloud projects are a thing of the past. Most companies are working on their third or fourth now. So if you haven't started with your first or second, uh, you're a bit behind relative to your peers if you're a global 2000 company. And change management and cloud governance are becoming more commonplace and accepted by the enterprise. We'll go through each one of these. So the degree of adopting cloud, what degree are you adopting public cloud? Well, the largest percentage is migrating non-mission critical assets to the cloud, which was 31%. Uh, thir I mean, 31 of the respondents are 25%. And then ultimately, the ability to uh, move into test dev environments uh, and also, some of them have not actually responded or actually moved into the cloud. So the thing is that moving forward is that the uh, uh, migrating uh, dev tests and migrating non-mission critical systems seem to be a pattern. Next question, how many business units in your organization are using public clouds such as AWS? And we had um, 38 respond, and AWS seems to be uh, one of the most popular, so two to five are, are uh, using it. One, 29, seven to 10, 18, and uh, that's kind of the way it, uh, it moved forward. So we can kind of gather from that that uh, AWS is certainly picking up steam, and it's typically gonna be the public clouds that people are using. However, what we're also seeing in the research um, and I posted this a couple of weeks ago, is that Google is picking up momentum along with Microsoft. So the idea that AWS is gonna be a 100 pound gorilla and just kind of take the market completely, it seems to be kind of moving around three providers right now. That's Google, AWS, and Microsoft, with Google and AWS kind of relatively picking up steam, but certainly AWS is not slowing down. They continue to gather market share, they continue to do a pretty good job. Degree of adopting AWS, what degree are you adopting AWS? Uh, all cloud resources on AWS, which was 10%. Uh, two or more public cloud resources are 31%, not using AWS, 29%. What you can kind of gather from this is um, that we're moving into kind of a complex multi-cloud kind of an architecture. So more people who are deploying public clouds aren't necessarily deploying a single brand. And we're finding that as well in our practice. So we see AWS, we see OpenStack and we see uh, uh, VMware, certainly all deployed in the same architecture and that's risen, that's uh, actually caused the popu popularity of uh, uh, multi-cloud management systems or cloud management platforms 
to start to pick up because these complexities need to be managed through a layer of abstraction. AWS is certainly a game and a big game, but it's not the only game in town, despite what you read, in the, read out there. They're using a multitude of cloud providers. In many respects, they've taken a lot of the clouds that were part of, uh, 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 you know, part of the uh, 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 shadow IT, you know, people kind of building things behind the scenes. And those guys are saying, here IT, take this, I can't manage it anymore. And suddenly IT finds themselves with a portfolio of 10 to 15 different cloud providers that they didn't pick, but they have to manage. That's the reality going out there. I hear a lot of complaints from that. What public cloud providers are you currently using? AWS, Google, IBM, Rackspace, Microsoft Azure, and that kind of uh, threw me for a loop because I actually saw growth in Microsoft, but I didn't see that kind of growth in Microsoft. So whether it was just the audience that we're moving after, whether the Microsoft shops or not, uh, but we're seeing um, more growth from uh, Google and IBM and, Mic and certainly Microsoft than we thought we had in the past. So the idea that AWS has everything locked up and no one's gonna be able to touch them, you know, I can certainly see the numbers how uh, that would bear that out. You see AWS and certainly the bar graphs, it's way up here and everybody else is kind of down here. Uh, but the adoption rate, utilization rate within the companies, at least the ones we surveyed, uh, seem to be showing that it's more heterogeneity uh, that they're looking for. And brand names such as IBM and Microsoft are just as valuable to them, if not more valuable to them, than AWS in many instances. So it depends on who's adopting the cloud and how they're moving in the space. AWS is picking up, is picking up steam, certainly in the enterprise, uh, but they've been mainly relying on the SMB space in the past. So the dynamics of these markets are starting to change. It's becoming more evenly distribu distributed, and the momentum seems to be going with the uh, first, second, and third place players. Excuse me, second, third, and fourth place players. Biggest challenges, uh, migration, compliance, and the biggest one was security going forward. It's the number one reason why people don't move to the cloud, and it's the number one reason uh, why people, I think, abandon their existing cloud pro uh, projects. Compliance freaks them out and security freaks them out because they just can't uh, get to a point uh, where adoption is, and the benefits of adoption is going to account for the risks that they see coming into the organization in terms of security. The reality is, though, if you're smart and you do architecture and you know, all the hard things to do initially up front, you can, chances are you can have an application that's gonna be more secure, or data that's more secure on a public cloud provider than it is within a traditional data center, if you understand the mechanisms and the approaches and things like that. But it's a big leap for enterprises, I think, to move in that direction. It may be an overinvestment in terms of what they want to spend on moving at least the first initial system. So this kind of stuff still freaks them out. Number of public cloud instances in production daily, um, 1 to 10, 30, 11 to 50, 23, 51 to 100. So it's starting to increase in terms of intensity as well as uh, cloud adoption. So not only are people adopting these clouds, but they're intentionally, intensely using the instances. Uh, so they're making them scale, putting them to work, real production, high-performing systems, uh, spending some real money. Uh, a lot of bills they see, $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 a month. Uh, they're coming back from utilization of public cloud providers these days. What's the time frame for implementing the projects? We've already deployed it, 42. ASAP 11, six months 21, and more than a year 14. So every, what's interesting about this is that most people who responded to the survey have some deployment capabilities. Most of them have already done it and are look, moving to their second or third projects, and it continues to be on the roadmap in terms of where they're looking to go. What, are the core uh, what is the core value that you're seeing, sorry, seeking from cloud computing? Used to be agility across the board was what all the surveys said. This particular survey, we found cost reduction being the biggest driver. And the reason is, is because these things are sold internally as cost-driven kinds of projects. So the reason we're gonna do this is because it's going to pay for itself. Uh, and so we think that the cloud is going to be self-funding and moving into the cloud is gonna save us a bunch of money. We can put that right back into the development and the technology. That is a pipe dream, by the way. It's an accordion in terms of spending money to get to the cost reduction, but if you think that you're gonna incrementally move this stuff forward and use uh, savings that won't occur for two years now to fund the projects, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. 
Uh, but cost reduction continues to be the most biggest reason people are driving to cloud. Agility second. The problem with agility, it has a larger strategic value and a larger monetary value. It just is very hard for people in enterprises to define as real dollars. What are the top governance challenges? User management, speed management, change management. The largest is security. And next is understanding the risk. So security becomes how do we manage it, how do we deal with compliance, how do we deal with auditing, all those sorts of things. They're looking in the press and they see Target getting their information ripped off, Home Depot getting their information ripped off, uh, iCloud you know, getting uh, bad press you know, in the last uh, three or four weeks, and it is freaking them out. And it's very difficult to talk them off the ledge. Uh, but again, this is, can be solved with approaches and dealing with different technologies and things like that. But it's still a largest issue uh, in terms of perception out there. Key issues with managing public cloud security again, governance, performance, cost management in those orders. And again, security keeps popping up. So if you go back two years ago, security was kind of waning in terms of reasons why people weren't moving into the cloud. Uh, because we were standing up cloud-based systems, everything was secure, nothing was uh, breached. The Snowden stuff happened, all of the breaches occurred that typically weren't cloud-based systems, by the way. Target was not a cloud-based uh, system that got ripped. Um, and it uh, basically filtered into the adoption of cloud. Uh, what departments are driving your organization to adopt cloud computing? Uh, operations, but the biggest one is IT. Uh, even though it's kind of interesting that marketing has such an influence, finance has such an influence in it. So the CFOs and the marketing organizations are definitely stepping out of the, uh, the shadows and telling IT how they want information consumed. And by the way, take a look at cloud computing. I just read this article on this airline magazine, and you know, this is the way you need to go. So IT is kind of feeling the pressure, but ultimately kind of falls into their hands in terms of adopting and moving into cloud. Do you have a formal change management process to place? Yes, they do. Most do not. Uh, and some of them are in flight, and, which is scary to me, that we're doing you know, these sorts of development operations. There's no methodology. And, and by the way, I think you know, some of this is probably embarrassing to some of the people who are filling out the survey. They may be a little bit a lying going forth. I think it's a little worse than this kind of lays it out. The use of cloud computing fall, uh, fails in your organization. What will be the likely cause? And the biggest thing, security problems outage issues, performance problems, things like that. So they're worried about security again, they're worried about outages, they're worried about performance, they're worried about the applications not basically functioning as well as they do on premise, and therefore cloud computing failing as a concept and they're pulling the thing down and the thing kind of falling away. Uh, most of the reasons that I see cloud computing fail out there is lack of management, lack of understanding, and uh, ultimately, uh, performance issues around bad uh, application design to the point we made at the beginning of the presentation that it requires some operations, it requires some architecture to make these things work. Use of cloud governance approaches, processes, and policies accepted by IT organization, which is a change from a couple of years ago. I think if I would have put this up there, it probably would have been uh, half that uh, because people are seeing the value of this stuff. So the cloud management platforms, the right scales of the world. I mean, all these things that are out there to help us do better with cloud, they're working well, they're in place, they're in production, and they're adding value. What cost considerations associated with managing public clouds? Additional security, the biggest one again. What are the key features businesses should look for in managing a hybrid cloud? Security keeps popping up over and over again. Management, multi-cloud governance, all these sorts of things, these very key, cool management concepts, they keep coming back to security in terms of how are you going to make my stuff more secure? Well, what about managing the multiple cloud environments, things like that? Uh, that doesn't seem to concern them as much. Make it secure, make it secure, make it governable, make it manageable, make it turnkey, make it solid. If I need to move in this environment, I need to be able to sleep at night. Tell me how to do that. Which is your biggest concern when deploying in public cloud environments? Uh, security. What operational data is most important to understand? Please rank in order of importance, costs, Utilization, availability, security, usage by department. I'm as confused as you guys are. <laughs> what results can be drawn from the operational data? Operational efficiency, organizational agility, organization productivity. So operational efficiency, organizational productivity uh, become, uh, become core in terms of people gathering operational data out of their environment. 
Uh, would you consider the value of gathering operational data over a long duration of time? Biggest the ability to gather uh, data for planning, operations, capacity planning, and budgeting. And do you think or feel you are currently using cloud resources efficiently? And 30% said pretty sure uh, that they are efficiency based in their understanding of the practices. So they don't know, but they're pretty sure that they're doing the right things in, in running cloud effectively. When collecting operational data, I'll move by that. So anyway, um, I have 31 seconds. So uh, anybody have any last questions? <laughs> I got 25 seconds. Cool. All right, one question. Yeah, I'm seeing less and less adoption of private clouds. And uh, well, because they, they just don't see the cost efficiency from it. If cost is the driver, then they don't see us. If I have to buy my own hardware and software and maintain it and hire people to, in essence, stick it in the data center, normally it's redundant to existing systems that are there. Uh, it's going to cost more money. And they seem to be balking at that. Now, now, and this is even getting out of the argument about the value of a private cloud. This gets into what you pay for it and the value that they think they're going to get out of it. And I'm just seeing that more and more. It used to be two years ago. All we saw within our consulting practice was private clouds. All we did was OpenStack and you know, did a lot of eucalyptus and did a lot of uh, uh, hybrid cloud computing. Uh, two years going forward, almost everything we see coming in is, private, is public cloud driven. So in other words, and that's what the enterprises are asking for. We're not even going in there recommending it. They're coming to us with this need and this requirement. It's a great question. Uh, one more and then Actually, we're done. Actually, I have a yeah. mic here. Hey, David, great talk. Thanks. Michael Crandell from RightScale. Hello. You got a free plug. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, what, what are you hearing about Docker, and what do you think about it? I'm hearing great things about Docker, um, and I'm normally a skeptic, uh, uh, skeptic kind of guy. Uh, the ability to, Docker is the ability to kind of create an open source standard for creating containers and the ability to kind of build applications using containers versus you know, virtualization and some of the other techniques we used in the past. The cool thing about that is it makes it portable from a uh, platform that supports Docker to platform that supports Docker. And if you look at some of the initial momentum there, uh, Google's Kubernetes, which was adopted by Microsoft, uh, you're seeing a lot of Docker development that's occurring out there certainly in the open source space. Um, and it's just a much more efficient and much more lightweight architecture for building and deploying applications. So what I think about it now is that we're still watching it. We're using it somewhat. Uh, we're doing a lot of research around it. Um, certainly has potential. Uh, we're not seeing a ton of it out there in terms of operational deployments. But the reality is I haven't seen a lot wrong with it. You know, as I've been looking at it and looking at the technology. And if you think about containers, it's, containers have been around since I've been in my 20s. It's really about taking something that's known to work, redeploying it in the cloud space at the right time, solving a problem that needs to be solved, including the ability to have a more lightweight way to launch these things and manage these things in these environments. So that's what I think about it. Thanks, guys.